Create STN, the, the requirements and the gaps, and uh, this is going to be largely based on my experience at Verizon. Um, I was at Verizon for, for seven years prior to being at Huawei, and I've gotten quite a bit of experiences in what's going on with the service provider STN and the requirements that, uh, that the um, providers in general have for that. So why do carriers need SDN? Well, what, what carriers really want to do is they really want to reduce their network cost and complexity and increase their service flexibility. They'd like to be able to quickly introduce new services and bring up new customers on the, the, their networks as quickly as possible. Um, right now, this can uh, sometimes, especially for a new service, be a pretty long process that can, uh, that, that can take months to years, and they'd like to be able to be much more flexible uh, than that. And sometimes it can take weeks or months to provision new customers, and that's all lost revenue. Uh, when you have delays with either new services or new customers. So really, so service providers really need to get those online as quickly as possible. Uh, they need ways to quickly adapt to changing traffic patterns. Uh, that is uh, very difficult to do in today's service provider networks. Uh, very often these processes are manual and, uh, and require a lot of time. Uh, quickly adapt to uh, it says that changing traffic patterns. They need um, application or policy-based traffic steering, which they currently do not have. And they would very much like an open and standards-based interface to customers. Um, that is starting to show up in, provide, in service provider networks. But um, the ability to allow customers to dynamically request bandwidth when required and release it when not with specific service characteristics there are some service providers that are starting to have a web-based interface for this, but it'd be wonderful to have a programmatic interface to applications. And you'll see a lot of that happening in the SDN arena, and that's certainly a reason why service providers want to see SDN in their networks. And also, they love to have centralized management to optimize resource utilization, and I'll be going more into why that's important. So, what it, so also to include what carriers need STN, they want to be able to automate previously manual procedures. As I said before, um, a service provider's greatest operational expense is their personnel, and the automation of manual procedures uh, enables uh, huge operational econo uh, economies and reduces the time to market for new services and brings up new customers much more quickly. Uh, it also allows the use of network, uh, SDN allows the use of network measurement to automatically feed back the centralized network control to optimize network uh, resource usage, and I'll I have a diagram that goes into that in, in more detail on an upcoming slide. So these are your basic SDN components, and this is directly from the, um, the ONS architectural specification. You have management over on the left with management functions and the operational support system. At the very top, you have SDN applications. The applications have programmatic um, CPI, which is the, the interface to um, the, basically it's the application to controller plane interface. That's what ACPI stands for. Then you have the controller plane, uh, which has your SDN controller, and then you have the data con to a controller plane interface, and you have the actual network elements with the data plane down at the bottom. So the um, requirements fall into several categories, and I'll be going in more in detail on each of these. Network features, migration from where they are now to being able to use SDN, security, management, provisioning, and application interfaces. These are all of extreme importance to service providers. So uh, first comes programmatic programmability. Uh, a, a service provider really needs their network to support APIs for extended, uh, for extending their functionality, uh, taking advantage of feature combinations available in the underlying devices. And without programmability, you really can't do that now. Um, they need the network to be serviceable, to be dynamically updated with minimal service interruption. Uh, without manual processes the way it is now. You want completely automatic software upgrade and rollback. Again, 
Now this is a very manual procedure and it would be great if that could be automated. Uh, you want the network to support multiple devices from multiple vendors, of course, it, with multi-vendor interoperability. Um, networks need to have that 5.9 resilience when they're using STN. Uh, you, you really need the mechanisms for survivability and resilience. We've already had talks earlier today about that. Uh, th that very topic. And has to be no loss of performance or throughput when a service provider moves from a traditional ne network infrastructure to an SDN-based infrastructure. So finally, um, they have sp specific migration requirements uh, that there be a very clear and easy migration path from their current network infrastructure to an SDN-based infrastructure. Of course, um, no one can afford to do a, a forklift upgrade, and you have to interwork with your existing installed base. That's an absolute requirement. And uh, you have to be able to incrementally introduce SDN where it adds the most value. So, for example, being able to start at the edge of the network where you can use OpenFlow or other SDN control interfaces and complementary management protocols there to enable new control paradigms on existing forwarding hardware, and then you can, meanwhile, continue to, to use your legacy protocols and equipment at the core, and then slowly move in from the edge to the core. And when you can, and when it makes sense in terms of your um, equipment replacement schedule, for example, uh, go ahead and then replace the legacy and uh, hybrid hardware with low-cost HDN only hardware. But again, only when it makes economic sense for your network. Now, there are security requirements. As we know, uh, for those of you in this, who work with service providers, you have absolute security requirements for your network in order to give your customers confidence that they can, they can um, use your network services. So in the data plane, you need data confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. In the control plane, you need to make sure you have authentication mechanisms between the network controllers and the network elements. Uh, when you're doing network control, you need facilities to isolate one application from another and one um, customer from another. Mechanisms for operators and applications to enforce privacy um, and as an assignment of specific network resources to, uh, spe to spe specific applications. And then, of course, you need um, security in the application interface. So app the authentication should support existing credentials that are likely to be used in data centers, for example. Interfaces must support the uh, transport of credentials for authorization, and application controller interfaces must provide mechanisms for operators and applications to ensure their privacy. Again, these are all um, absolutely essential for a service provider. Then the service providers also have management requirements. They want to be able to move away from the traditional manual processes, CLIs, scripts, and everything else that's, that's extremely time intensive and manual process intensive to, um, to be able to move to use automation, network element programmability, and centralized management and these all enable the uh, customer portals and applications, um, flow through provisioning from order entry, automated adjustment to changing network conditions, and you also want a standardized northbound interface from the, from the network controllers to the customer, so that allows customer applications to instantiate services through a very securely managed and mediated interface. So what customers see is an abstraction of the network where they're able to say, okay, I need a particular service from this network. I need a, a path set up from point A in the network, from interface A to interface B, with a particular amount of bandwidth and with a particular um, maximum transit delay and so on. So what we want to do is we want to move from the traditional way that you do network management that we show on the left with a 
customer making a phone call to a network operations center or to customer support, leading to manual processes in the operations center to, to deal with the OSS. Then you have a proprietary southbound interface to the, to the network. And we want to move over to the processes that you see over on the right-hand side where a customer can deal with, for example, a web-based user, user interface with um, service support applications, with policy enforcement, and the network operations center is dealing with the OSS where manual control is necessary, and then you can have your emu emulation of the existing OSS interface, which allows for a smooth migration of existing OSSs, because again, we can't expect um, service providers to have to change out their existing OSSs overnight, and this comes into the SDN controller along with standalone applications that can make requests from the SDN controller. And then you have a st standardized interface to an SDN based interface to the network. In terms of network, the network architecture that you can look at in terms of a, an actual carrier SDN based network architecture, and this is similar to what some uh, carriers are starting to deploy, um, you have your applications and your services at the top with, um, with your BSS, you know, your business support system, operational support system, and your network services. You have a northbound interface such as OpenStack. OpenStack is used here as an open source source example. Um, then that leads in, into policy going into online planning and you can have real time traffic analysis and policy management going on in your SDN controller platform and again some open source examples of those are Open Daylight and Onos which we've heard a lot of um, this week about both of those and this outputs uh, service policy based network constraints which then go into a centralized network controller. The network controller takes the policy, the results of the policy and traffic analysis to decide what's the optimal routes or flows through the network. And then it uses a southbound interface to the network elements and that southbound interface can take a number of different forms depending on what are the protocols you're actually using in the network. You can be open flow, of course, but for if you still have legacy equipment in the uh, network, it could be BGP. It could be PCEP, which we've heard a lot about today as well. Um, and this ends up with, with uh, forwarding policy adjustments made in the actual in the network equipment. Then you have measurements going on in, in the lower, in the left-hand side of the data plane, where the the network and services are real-time SLA aware, and they feed back up in terms of in of flow performance measurements and SNMP uh, traps and so on back up into the traffic analysis, so now you have a, a real-time feedback loop in terms of what's happening in the network, and you can make real-time adjustments in terms of any congestion that's occurring in the network, the amount of, of um, bandwidth utilization in each of the trunks, and the amount of processor utilization in each of the, uh, in each of the forwarding elements, and so on, and then that allows you to, to, to deploy the actual applications that you see down at the bottom where you have for applications such as mobile backhaul, you have optical backbones, um, you have IP cores, and you, ha and you have data centers over in the far right. Th th those are just examples, of course. Now, one other place where SDN really helps a lot is for multi-layer optimization when you're doing applications such as uh, packet over optical networks. And traditionally, when you have a packet network that's actually being carried by an optical network, well, you have a lot of work that has to happen in both layers because the paths, you know, you, you have um, what, are, what, are, what look like to be paths all at the um, packet layer, but what the packets are actually doing is they're going through a router, they're going down an optical interface into the optical layer, then they're being carried through fibers in the optical layer to another switch, and then going back up to the packet layer, and so on. So there's a lot of multi-layer routing that has to happen, and a lot of multi-layer path calculation 
Now, the traditional way of doing all that work is shown in the upper right, the traditional service uh, provisioning, where you have typically different groups in your organization doing your IP network planning and your packet network planning and your optical network planning. Those are awfully, uh, often done by different groups. Then you have manual configuration to try to glue together what's happening at the two layers, and you end up with a fixed network topology, which is very difficult to change as conditions change in the network. For example, it's, it can be very difficult to change the topology of the optical paths through the network to, um, to match the changes that are happening, happening in terms of the uh, change of flows or, or different traffic patterns in the uh, in the packet layer of, above. What you really want is automatic pack, uh, path adjustment between the IP and optical layer, automatic bandwidth adjustment on demand. Um, you want to improve your network utilization at both layers, and you want to provide the flexible service provisioning on demand. So what we really need is what you see in the lower right, which is the SDN-based service provisioning, which is uh, basically um, um, centralized controllers that have a complete view of the topology at both layers and are able to do multi-layer optimization in one place that, that's stateful and because it's in one place and it's centralized, it has a complete view of the utilization about the, at both the optical layer and at the packet layer. It knows what's happening on each of the optical fibers in terms of the amount of bandwidth that's been provisioned and how much bandwidth is still left and so on. And that really allows you to end up with a dynamic network topology that is optimized at, at, at both of those layers. So we just went through a large number of requirements that service providers have for SDN. Now, unfortunately, SDN does not currently meet all of these requirements. Uh, because SDN uh, originated in the enterprise and data center space. And however, there is a lot of work that's ongoing, um, both in the Open Networking Foundation and elsewhere, to address these requirements. So um, the, the ONF is split up into a number of different areas. Um, the operational area is where we have um, service providers that get together to define what their requirements are. And we have two working groups in that area that specialize in carrier requirements. The first is the carrier grade working group, which basically says, okay, what are the aspects of SDN that we have to, and open flow that we have to extend in order to be able to meet all the service provider requirements. And the second is the migration working group, which says, okay, we have networks, we have service providers that have traditional networks now. They want to be able to transition to STN in the future. What can we do to make that job as easy as possible? What are use cases that we can provide to them in order to show them how to make it possible? And so on. So that's happening right there. Uh, then we have the specifications area. That's the um, part of the ONF that deals with the actual open flow uh, specification. And there are currently two groups that are working on extensions to open flow for particular carrier based applications. The first is the optical transport. Uh, working group. The job of the optical transport working group is to say, okay, we, what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to take open flow and we'd like to be able to take the, the SDN paradigm of centralized management and we'd like to be able to adapt it for not only for Ethernet and not only for packet networks that use MPLS, but for optical networks as well. So this is, you can think of it as kind of like an extension of the generalized MPLS work that was done in the IETF, first of all. The IETF took MPLS, which is a packet technology, and generalized it so that it works with optical networks as well. So this is the same sort of thing that the ONF is doing. It's taking um, uh, OpenFlow, which is a packet uh, oriented technology and extending it so it can also be useful for optical networking. And the other is the wireless and mobile working group, which is saying, okay, what can we do to SDN to make it useful for mobile networks, both in the mobile arena and, and for backhaul as well. 
And finally, the services area where I'm the area director has a number of working groups that are also looking at what are the various aspects of SDN that need to be enhanced in it so that we can apply SDN in the service provider environment. The first is layer four through seven services. Uh, for those of you who follow OpenFlow, know that OpenFlow basically started with Ethernet, which is a layer two technology. Since then, it's been extended to layer three with the addition of being able to support MPLS um, labels at the beginning of packets, being able to push, pop, and swap MPLS labels to uh, make it basically a, a layer three protocol as well. And now we're also looking at, well, if we want to have layer four through seven services and support those, what changes and extensions do we need to make to uh, OpenFlow for that? Next is the northbound interfaces working group. It says, uh, what can we do to standardize a set of northbound interfaces or a single northbound interface such that we can have customer applications such as a data center being able to make programmatic requests for services to the service provider. And what we're doing a lot of work on right now is what's known as the intent-based northbound interface, which is to look at the intentions of the customer. So the customer doesn't have to know all the details of how to get packets from point A to point B. The customer can just make a request of the network to say, okay, I have an interface in San Francisco, I have an interface in New York City, and I need to get particular types of traffic between here and there, um, let's say video traffic, and the video traffic needs a particular bandwidth, it needs a particular maximum amount of jitter, and it needs a particular bound on the, uh, on the delay, and it needs sequentiality for the packets. So that's the interface that we're working on right now in the Northbound Interfaces group. And finally, we have a security group. And like I said, um, security is paramount for, um, for service providers. It's not always been that case uh, when you use, for example, um, OpenFlow in an enterprise network where the entire network is owned by one enterprise, and internal security may not be as important. But when you're a service provider and you have m multiple thousands or, or millions of individual customers whose traffic has to be separated and protected from each other, and you want to make sure that no one customer can make can do any harm to the network that would affect any other customer, security becomes paramount. Um, and, and that's especially important when you have the ability to have a programmatic interface to the network. Um, there's also, as, as we've seen uh, today and prior to today in the conference, there's a lot of SDN related work going on in the IETF as well, Internet Engineering, Engineering Task Force, and the IRTF, which is the Internet Research Task Force, uh, such as PCE, we've heard a lot about PCE and PCEP, I2RS, the interface to the routing system, SFC, um, which is um, service, service function chaining. Thank you very much. Having a little mind fart there. Uh, forces, NVO3, uh, which is I IP and MPLS for data centers. Spring, which is segment routing. We've heard all about segment routing th this morning. So that's what happens in the spring working group. And of course, the SDN research group in the um, IRTF. Enhancements are also being contributed uh, to the open source SDN controllers, primarily Open Daylight and Onos. And the ONF, Open Networking Foundation, is working with both of these. Uh, we have a very close relationship with Onos. In fact, the ONF's headquarters is in the same building as ON Lab, who is a, who, who are the folks who are primarily working on Onos, and also we have a lot of people who are, uh, work in the um, in the ONF and with Open Daylight as well. And for that intent-based northbound interface I told you about, we're doing both Open Daylight and Onos implementations. In fact, in the uh, ONF, we're concentrating a lot this year on not just writing specifications, but doing open source implementations 
of what we're producing as well to make the output as, as useful uh, for, our, um, for our membership and for the industry as possible. And finally, uh, there are some carriers who are trial uh, trialing SDN with some vendor-specific controllers and enhancements. And we hope and, uh, you know, we expect and we hope that they will then migrate to use open source and standards-based implementations as they become available and as they become more reliable. And we already heard from our previous speaker, for example, how um, with Open Daylight Helium was, was much more useful and reliable than hydrogen. And, and we can expect lithium, which is going to be coming out later this spring, to, to be another um, you know, big enhancement in, in terms of a reliability and usefulness for open daylight. So with that, I'd like to thank you and ask if you have any questions. I see a question right there. Santiago. The, the microphone is coming. Uh, hello, I'm Nick Robichek, T-Mobile. I do have a question. Uh, if we implement as a, uh, service providers this kind of uh, automation, is there any concern about if everyone does has, has uh, have this tool, mm -hmm. there will be some kind of uh, SDN uh, SDN war? <laughs> if, because obviously, first thing which comes to my mind is traffic steering. Right. And once someone kicks in, the other one will start to uh, say do the things uh, to optimize in his, in his way. Mm -hmm. So is there any, any concern on this? Well, that's going to, I, I think that's more of a question of implementation than it is of, uh, of a protocol specification. Um, and certainly there will be growing pains as some carriers start to implement STN and others don't, of course. And, at the, and I think the place where we'll see the, the greatest amount of friction is at the, the provider to provider interface, right? And so, uh, so but we'll, I think the question is no one really knows the answer to, the question, to that question yet. Uh, but we'll certainly find out as we see implementations and deployments go forward. Are we here? Santiago. Yes, I wanted to make a comment, actually the comment on the previous uh, presentation. Uh, there was a reference that... Oh, on uh, the previous presentation? Yes. Okay. Sorry, it's a comment. Uh, that uh, there was uh, mentioned that uh, a PC or the stable PC was not a standard yet. Uh, I want to mention that we've tested interoperability of at least three commercial um, controllers with PSAP and at least three router vendors, so I think is a there's a good level of interoperability that we're able to test successfully. And the other comment that there was no way to make use of a policy with PCE, there's actually a, a proposal in the working group, uh, it's called PCE Profiles, and there's at least one implementation of it, so. Okay, cool, thanks. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Um, you have been the first speaker mentioning honors, as far as I've noticed. Um, my question is, uh, why do we have two open source platforms, Honors and Open Daylight, in parallel? Is there any collaboration between these two organizations, or do they simply coexist in competition? Well, um, unfortunately, you must have missed the talk about Honors yesterday. Um, yes. the, the, I have, <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay, so there was quite a, a lengthy talk about Onos yesterday that went into a lot of this, um, but the short answer is that um, Onos is being designed for the service provider environment. Um, it has a lot of features that will help service providers quickly be able to use it because it was um, written with uh, or designed, I should say, with a lot of service provider requirements in mind, such as, for example, resiliency and survivability. So it has the ability to, to um, distribute its control protocols and databases with automatic replication and backup between a number of physical um, servers. 
So you don't have to worry about uh, being able to, uh, to, you don't have to manually back up your servers and it's all done automatically for you, which is a very important feature when you're a service provider because you cannot have a single point of failure in your network. And there are some other uh, the requirements that they've put into Onos um, to really help that. Now, open daylight has for the most part really come from a data center and enterprise-centric background. That's where it started. Now, in the future, I expect the, um, Open Daylight will, will take on a lot of the functionality that you see in Onos as well. But for now, the primary distinction between the two is that Onos is more aimed at the service provider environment, while at present, Open Daylight is more aimed at the data center and, and enterprise environment. OK? Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, and it's perfectly right on time for our next speaker and our last speaker of the day. So we have the one person who's unlucky enough to bring you into dinner time, and let me just set up his talk right now. Here we go.